The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar hosted by FP Markets and presented by Gary Burton. For those of you that don't know us, FP Markets is an Australian-owned and asset-regulated company that has been a leading performer in the industry for the past 13 years, receiving 35 industry awards, including highest overall client satisfaction for six years running. Our vision is to facilitate a one-stop destination where traders could access a full suite of trading products, including global markets. We facilitate the convenience of being able to trade CFDs from the one account across equities, indices, commodities, futures, and forex. What sets us apart from the rest of the field is our experience and understanding of what traders need. We have learned through 13 years in the industry that pricing, execution speed, platform functionality, product range, customer support all sit high up. But the pinnacle is market analysis and education for our traders. This being, in our opinion, the main factor in creating successful traders, hence the collaboration with Gary today, who we believe offers extremely valuable trading education and market analysis, striving to offer our clients the best tools they need to trade. We generally use the IRIS platform to facilitate equity CFD trading, allowing you exposure to all of the global exchanges as well as pressures, metals and futures contracts. We run a direct market access model of trading, in which your CFD is put directly into the market depth of the live exchange which we believe provides an extra layer of transparency for our clients. So we will be running a promotion off the back of this webinar for our new customers. Um, this webinar, uh, sorry, this promotion will, you'll receive a bonus commission rate of 0.1% with no minimum charge upon the opening of a new CFD trading account. So for example, if you're just looking, so maybe it's the first time you're looking at shorts, um, if, you just, if you place a $1,000 short in the market, you'll only get charged $1 for that trade. Um, alternatively, if you're looking more on the FX and index side of things, um, we'll be running a $100 trading credit when $200 is deposited into MC4 trading accounts. Um, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Gary and he'll start the webinar. Thank you. All right, thank you, James. I'm assuming everyone could hear that. Um, we'll just do a sound check while we're here. Um, if you just type yes into the question area and we're coming through, that would be good. Sound is always a key issue with um, GoToWebinar for some reason. Okay. All right, let's get ourselves underway. So a little bit uh, of my background for those that don't know me, this is uh, just a bit of my background. Uh, I hold the Diploma in Technical Analysis through FINSA <clears throat> way back in 2003. Uh, I'm a certified uh, technical analyst uh, with, with, with IFTA. Uh, I used to hold ADA 1 and 2 derivatives accreditation. I spent several years on the desk uh, broking with Macquarie, RBS, Morgan, and Wilson, and a few others. Um, technical analyst with um, FP Markets and IG Markets. Uh, currently, uh, I've done some work with Sky Business. Uh, currently, I'm a member of the Professional Technical Analyst Association in Australia. I write for Thomson Reuters. So I do a bit of writing for First Prudential and a contributor to your Trading Edge magazine. So that's me in a nutshell. Uh, let's get on with this. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about uh, the building blocks of technical analysis, looking at looking at price action and uh, looking at price action. Just some simple setups uh, to look at uh, that you can use basically in any time frame. So uh, we'll be uh, looking at some uh, very simple things. I'm going to be juggling two uh, platforms here. I'll be dragging them on and off the screen. But uh, I want to look at, um, as I say, some simple setups, things that uh, if you're starting out in trading, um, often uh, we get 
too complicated. Uh, many people come to the market believing the more that they know about technical analysis, the better trader they will be, and actually nothing could be further from the truth. Um, technical analysis and trading are two different subjects uh, altogether. Technical analysis is, is monitoring and acknowledging your price action and gathering some statistics around that, whereas trading is really money management and um, your account management uh, is involved in trading itself. So I'll be looking at um, just some setups on the charts uh, around decision making, we're defining a price trend, uh, drawing useful trend lines and uh, working with indicators. We'll have a look at the RSI and Bollinger Bands and a couple of simple ways to, a couple of simple ways to use them. So the beginning, uh, when we talk about rule-based trading, it's um, one of the ways of uh, developing a rule-based system uh, that you can use, you can apply money management to, is the first thing we need to do is dis decide, well, what time frame are we going to use and what setup within that time frame or setups in that time frame. It really, uh, then will it work in all market conditions? And often traders step up to their screens and open up an account and, and uh, without really understanding uh, which way the markets are going and, and taking lots of information in from outside sources rather than sourcing the information from themselves and from uh, what they see on the screen. And that's really what I'm about is that uh, traders source information from the screen. So we'll take a look at uh, some examples of that. I've got... Um, before we get going, I've got a, some notes here. This is part of a uh, back test that I did uh, on uh, gold. We can, I've grabbed just the bottom part of the spreadsheet here, and this shows on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see, and I'll get my little pen out, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, we can see here, this is the, the setup I used. I was looking for what's called an inside period, and the, uh, where we have a higher low and a lower high than the previous bar, and looking to place simply a buy order at the top of that bar and a sell order at the bottom of that bar as the next bar opened here. And um, eventually one of those buy orders or sell orders would get taken out. And, uh, and I built some statistics around that. What would happen if I did that? And uh, I went through gold, uh, there was 435, um, inside bars that we looked at and the long short and I recorded the the entry and the stop uh, which was at the other end of the bar in this case uh, the points won and and the exit price and the profit loss uh, in there and as an R based system a, a, as a risk reward system and then looked at the total points uh, that were gained along the way and it produced some interesting results and while um, most um, applications that I've seen and certainly my own applications, the win-loss ratio here was around about 50-50. We had 223 wins and 202 losses. So it was around about 50-50 win-loss ratio. So it becomes very sobering when you go to apply mar uh, money into the market uh, knowing that uh, half of your positions are going to lose money. And this is really the key to the trading side of the equation is you get to decide how much you're going to lose if that trade turns into a loser. This is a points return or an equity return on the um, <clears throat> on that strategy, that's the strategy there again, and I would point out, I would point out here, uh, there's a couple of things here that um, I would point out here that it looks great from uh, the bottom left to the top right, but there are some periods where really no gains were made over many, many trades. In this one in here, there was about 60 trades. Uh, taken uh, without any real return in there and then suddenly the application came back in and off the equity curve went again. So again it highlights that the the uh, trading is not necessarily making money every day but it's applying your, your methodology to the market. And uh, so this uh, system has proved out that um, it works, it has its foibles, but a simple, simple uh, system, an inside bar, uh, looking at the, at the particular one entity, in this case it was gold, 
and uh, these were the results. So when we start to break down our understanding of technical analysis, uh, I subscribe to a, a thing called Dow Theory, um, long story behind that, that Charles Dow looked at the markets and started to plot the average uh, prices each day and, and built this thing called the Dow Averages. And uh, as over the many years, he didn't start technical analysis by any stretch, but uh, after him came uh, Robert Ray and William Hamilton, they put together Dow's ideas and started to develop up these ideas of, of analysis uh, in the market. And many, many after more came after that through the 40s and 50s uh, and wrote many, many good books, uh, Murphy's Technical Analysis uh, among one of them. And uh, the, so they developed up this stream of technical analysis. So there's a, a Dow theory takes a look at the macro view, but it turns up in price analysis. So macro view is the global, is for example, the World Bank or the IMF or the trade or World Trade Organization uh, in there. We're seeing that play out at the moment where the um, Americans are uh, messing around with their tariffs and, and falling in and out of uh, trade agreements and it's showing up in, in prices. Then we come down to country, uh, specific country economics um, through statistical uh, releases of employment rates and what central banks are doing with interest rates. And then it comes down to company specific announcements that drive prices and the research around those announcements that uh, researchers do with a view of projecting that price into the future. So when we get down to technical analysis, we have this uh, top-down approach, and this has been uh, one of my favourite, um, uh, not my favourite, but my uh, it, this is my methodology of using uh, a weekly, daily, and then an intraday chart to get a view of something, to develop up a view, and uh, most traders tend to use daily charts. I would encourage you to take a look at the weekly chart, and I'll show you why in just a moment, uh, but I would in encourage you to to get a view out of a larger time frame uh, when applying this to uh, equities, in particular equities, and um, uh, developing up a view about whether you're going to take a position in an equity or not. So Dow theory uh, is based on all of these things, uh, the business confidence, news of the day, interest rates, and, vo and traded volumes, and it all ends up in price, and it's it's been uh, said that uh, at the end of the day, that's the price that everyone agrees on as the market closes, and that's what they get to think about overnight uh, and take in the overnight news, and then we open the market the next day in the equities market. As you know, uh, FX and some commodities markets will trade uh, 24 hours a day, and they factor in news almost immediately that announcements come through. It's part of the risk of uh, trading FX and, and commodities, uh, in particular what we saw with the European announcement on Thursday night, we saw the euro drop uh, significantly 1.18 down to 1.15 um, in just a matter of minutes. Uh, and uh, so that uh, market has its has its own um, uh, volatility, if you like, uh, which is often different than the equities market. So let's take a look. When we define trend, when we define price trend, and this applies in in all time frames, but the concept of looking at the low of the market of the current low, and then the market rallies, prices move up, make a high, and as they fall back into a retracement of sorts. Uh, it's the moment that they break through that previous high is is the definition of trend. And a number of people have advocated at moving averages are trend. No, they're not, because moving averages are extremely subjective to what type of moving average you put on your screen. You can put a five period moving average on there, or you can put a 50 period moving average on there and it really comes down to what you want to see. And it is one of the great um, errors, if you like, that um, traders, when they're not in a good position in the market, they'll find a moving average or an indicator that will confirm uh, that they should still be there rather than uh, cleaning it up and taking the loss. So we're looking at price. It is, it is quite significant when price moves higher, when price moves higher, 
than what has been paid in the past, where buyers are willing to buy a price higher than what has been paid in the past. Uh, that paid in a, in the recent past. So this definition is is true for trend, as the market makes a low price, makes a high price, and makes a higher low, and then moves through that high, previous high, into a new high, into here. And hopefully, hopefully, of course, that we'd like that to continue on something that we're holding in a portfolio or, or buying uh, for our trading account. All right, and the, also the same applies for downtrend, where the market makes a high. After a series of higher lows and higher highs, we then uh, often get this lower high, and as we break the previous low, which happens to be a higher low uh, as the market moves up, of course, and as, as it breaks through that low after making a lower high, this is the point of trend. This is where the sellers are in control and uh, we're looking for then the market makes a new low down in here and if it sets a lower high and continues down and breaks through that low, we may say that then that the trend is continuing. You notice on my screen here that identifying the start of a downtrend on a weekly chart. Weekly charts are where you find what's called the primary market, the primary trend of a stock or an indice is out on a weekly time frame. And so if anybody asks me, what do you think of this or think of that, the first thing I do is go and look at a weekly chart, a uh, weekly price chart of that instrument. Within market movements, uh, what we have, uh, what we call secondary movements, they're these uh, where we have a primary move underway, we get these secondary moves come in Secondary moves are the consolidation periods within a trend. Secondary moves can last three weeks to many months. They can last in a, a few days at times, but uh, they can last uh, three weeks to many months uh, and are quite healthy inside a, a normal trend. And it is the business of the shorter term trader is to find this uh, area here where where we're looking for trends to resume, and we're going to take a look at that uh, as we get going. But uh, the secondary markets, they're a time of price confusion, as, uh, and we'll take a look in a moment at some charts, but they're a time when prices overlap each other. So the, and I'll go through this again, but essentially in this primary type of move when markets are really on the move, you tend to get price bars that stand on top of each other very, very strong price movements. When you come into these secondary markets, this is where we get the, the day that was down and the day that was up and the next day that was down and the next day was up again and then we had down and then down again and then up. We get this confused or consolidated price movement. This is described as the secondary move of the market or secondary move within the trend. These are highly probable areas that technical traders should be looking at to enter into an established trend if you're adding to your portfolio or adding to your, your um, collection uh, within your trading account. So as it says here, it is not a precise outcome, it depends on many factors, and uh, it is, but it is uh, provable, and I'll go through that in a moment, it is provable and it is a high probability outcome. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now I've got a weekly chart here, and this is a fairly easy example uh, to see. We can see I've marked just the, the obvious highs and lows, these, uh, these obvious highs and the lows and then the high, and then the, this is a higher low than it was back here. And so we are deemed to have this trend in place uh, in there. Then we're, as traders we're, or as holders of, of something, we're looking for this to continue to continue if you're a longer term position player, we're looking for this to continue into a continuing trend. And then we can see the, within this trend, this is an established uptrend, we can see there's some very strong bars, uh, weekly bars every now and again. These are the primary move, the primary part of the market out through here. And these areas we're looking in here, these are the secondary 
uh, secondary type of market. And as the note said, these can last from three weeks to many months. And we can sit, whoops, sorry. Uh, as we can see here, certainly this one has lasted a few months in here, <clears throat> excuse me. And we've had uh, one of about uh, seven or eight weeks in here and so on. And here's one that's lasted just for three weeks. So it's not an exact science, but it is it, what it does is put our price movements into context and uh, the context of, of a primary move underway or a secondary move underway, a secondary move taking place uh, inside our uh, price action. So we'll break this down a bit further and this is where really the uh, people coming to the market, new people coming to the market um, often don't get a grip on this. Uh, what's really happening here is they might understand trend, but we're looking here at the uh, weekly trend on the left hand side and we can clearly see it's a series of higher highs and higher lows as this price unfolds. And inside the weekly secondary market, if we break it down into a different time frame, in this case I'm using a, da a daily time frame, we can see that there's actually a daily downtrend. So anybody looking at this would say, well, okay, this is trending down, I should be short or I should be selling or I should be doing whatever I need to do, when in fact all it is is simply a retracement inside an established uptrend. It doesn't fit. It doesn't change. It doesn't change the primary trend. So daily downtrends uh, occur within a higher time frame, and this occurs in multiple time frames. When you look at, um, for example, um, daily charts against one-hour charts, that type of thing, it um, these shorter time frames can show a very different trend to what's actually occurring in a higher time frame. When we draw trend lines on a chart, the, there is a very um, strict methodology around trend lines. So I often see when we're looking at, uh, when you look at information that's freely available on the internet, which unfortunately most of it's wrong, uh, from a purely um, uh, not academic point of view, but from a specific technical analysis point of view, when trend lines are drawn inside price action like this, they're, they're actually quite drawn in error. Trend lines, when they're drawn on a chart, they never cut back through price action. If you put a line on a chart, if it cuts back through your price action, it's not a trend line. And the difficulty with this is that someone who may think that this is a good place to put a trend line, someone else will come in and go, well, I kind of like it out here that way, or I like it underneath here, that looks better for me, and so on. And so there is no, um, no uniformity around the application of a trend line. And so when we draw trend lines, trend lines always start find the chart with the lowest point that you can and trend lines are drawn forward until they're broken and then they're removed and they're drawn forward again under the next low and so on and then we're looking for two confirmations as a two touches as a um, tentative trend line and third touch as a confirmation draw them as accurately as you can but they are drawn underneath an uptrend and over the top of a downtrend. If the market is trending down, they are drawn over the top of a downtrend. They are never drawn inside price action like this, like we see on this example here. So this is the uh, correct methodology. We have the markets uh, low down here, and this is where we uh, call point number one. Uh, it, market went through initially a trend line may have moved up through here <coughs> excuse me and was broken was removed and uh, market retraced so uh, we had a line from uh, point one to point two ended there at some stage markets moved on and the extension of that line has been a point where the market has come back and retested that area and then moved on so we now have a valid after this point we now have a valid trend line. 
drawing them inside price action like this or drawing them inside price action like this is is wasting your time wasting your analytic uh, efforts if you like uh, they are simply drawn of the outside of price action so it's rarely that on a chart you'll have more than one or two lines defining uh, a trend line so let's look at some price analysis now We take a look at um, <clears throat> most traders use uh, candlesticks or open high low close bars here is a, a down close uh, candlestick <clears throat> uh, with a corresponding open high low close bar we can see that the market has opened uh, here candle uh, opens with just a line and at some stage the market's traded a little higher and then it's traded a little lower at some stage and then turned around and closed up at that point so the open high low close bar uh, shows the same <clears throat> shows the same outcome with the open here and the close over here so both showing the same information um, it's I prefer candles you can see them better there's a lot of method there's a lot of methodology around candles which may or may not be true but I find them easier to uh, easier to use so the corresponding green candle here we have the same with open close high and low and the corresponding open high low close bar as well um, it's not important trading doesn't get any better if you use candles or open high low close bars as many people think uh, I just find them I find them uh, easy to look at and um, they stand out for me a little bit so when we look at price analysis inside a price bar this is the this example I'll go back one here this particular bar here we've had an open we've had a close higher than the open it has traded a little higher but at some stage it has traded down many traders when they start out are willing to buy on a developing bar and the problem with that of course is that we go one the that bar opens at some point it might be the opening tick in the morning or it might be the opening the change over uh, the rollover between one hour to the next or one 12 hour period to the next 12 hour period or one four hour period to the next four hour period but it opens with the first tick on there and as the market uh, trades and as the market progresses in this case it may have moved down and moved back up to its opening price the clear issue is let me go back one the clear issue is that coming into the market looking at this straight away you think okay the market's going down I'll take a short position without letting the bar completely unfold and so we can see that the bar has moved higher back to the close back to the open I should say and then bars moved a little higher moved a little higher again as as the time period unfolds and could easily have moved back down uh, this way and then moved back up again and then finished uh, for that session until a new bar opens so it is wise to wait until the time frame that you're looking at wait until that bar has finished or completed and then look to um, use that information inside your trading uh, trading plan so there's the close of that session so then the next session uh, opens and we look at that session in, in relation to the previous uh, previous bar and the next session could be the same day or the next hour and here we can see the next session had the bar has completed and the buyers are in control and simply uh, taken the price higher so it's quite significant when markets uh, trade over a previous high when we talk about the definition of trend we can use that same methodology if you're looking at bar by bar analysis we can use that same methodology where this bar has a low this bar has a high this bar has a higher low and this bar has a completed higher high out here so we can look at that type of methodology and so between these two bars there is a small trend in there it is not the primary market it's simply a trend between two bars using that higher high and higher low methodology 
In this example here, the new bar has opened. It has traded higher at some point and then simply move down into a lower close only shows us that in this particular session the sellers have been in control so when we start to put it together one of my favorite setups and we're, and I, we're getting to some charts but one of my favorite setups in this uh, application of price and as simple as it is is simply the pivot point <clears throat> so pivot point can be defined as the bar that makes a low in here i've got a group of bars that the price has been moving down through here then we have finally we have each bar makes a new low and finally we have a bar that makes a low and the following bar in this case has closed and the important thing is the close is over the high of the bar that makes the low and if this bar is now complete and the next bar opens, we can say that there is a pivot point in place. This is this is back testable as a trading strategy to see if this is a buy entry or a buy setup of some sort or not. Keeping in mind that it is a better probability to trade with underlying trends, with got already got a an uptrend in place. Uh, this is a type of uh, entry that might provide an entry into that uptrend so I've got a note here that says pivot bar can be within three bars and what that means is that often um, markets aren't always the same as we know uh, often when the market makes a low uh, we can deem the pivot to be complete within the following three bars providing this low hasn't been broken uh, through there and within three bars, if we get a closing price that's higher than the bar that makes the low, makes the final low, uh, then we can deem that the pivot point is in place. And you can quite easily see that this bar here could easily have been an entry uh, for, for the very aggressive, uh, easily been an entry and would simply be stopped out as the market moves lower. This group or this uh, group here is you can back test this, you can pencil it out on some charts on the back of an envelope and write down the results about whether they actually work or not. And you'll find some very sobering um, statistics around that uh, when, you, when you do that, uh, depending on the instrument you're looking at, but it will give you a percentage of times that it works, a percentage of times, of course, that it doesn't, and what the potential payoff is uh, based on your strategy around that. And of course, the reverse pivot point is the same, is that the market has, in this case, the market has moved up and we have a bar that makes the final high in there. Then the following uh, bar makes a lower high and uh, closes, and the important uh, aspect here is the close, closes below the low of the bar that makes the high. This also can be within three bars. So this closing down bar. So what we're looking at here, this is the um, just a broad view of both of those applications. And if you want to take a screenshot or something of that, that's uh, an ideal thing to do. But uh, this is the definition of pivot point uh, in the market. Now uh, you will get some. As I, I'll get some charts out in a moment. I just want to get through some notes. The other aspect that we need to notice in charts, in particular in equities, and I think this is actually the ANZ Bank, uh, is that price gaps often get filled. And if they don't get filled, often price comes back and fills them. It's an interesting phenomena. Uh, it's um, one of those things that I have back tested. Uh, if you look inside Telstra, Telstra has no unfilled gaps, uh, even though it's $2.90 or whatever it is today. Uh, it has no unfilled gaps in its chart uh, in history, uh, not, not recently, but in history. And often we see these gaps get filled, uh, in this case here, and the price moves lower. And where gaps are partially filled, uh, often in some future price movements, we see them completely closed off it's a, it's a we could come up with all sorts of explanations don't know but uh, it uh, is a phenomena inside uh, particularly when you see things like this it is a phenomena inside price charts you have to 
acknowledge whether this is important to you or not, whether a, a gap can be filled if you're holding a position uh, and it's uh, moving against you, whether it's looking for the gap in, particularly in equity charts, it's a it's an interesting outcome. So we saw here that uh, this gap up here was filled almost on the next bar, was filled right there on the open of the next bar, and then came in close the gap, and the market um, moved moved lower. So it is a it is a phenomena worth uh, monitoring. Sorry, let me go back here. Okay, so the outside range. An outside range bar, of course, has the, uh, in this case here, I'll just let me start with the left, sorry. In this case here, has a lower low than the previous bar and has a higher high than the previous bar. There are some interesting statistics around outside ranges, uh, and I'll show you some charts in a moment again. Uh, here we have an outside range that has made a higher high than the previous bar and a lower low than the previous bar. There are times when the market uh, opens one way and then something changes during the session and the those that are on the buy, in particular here on the top, those that are on the buy side are then proven wrong and sellers enter the market. Is They're often large ranges and it um, really catches both sides of the market out at some point. So there is some confusion following that. They are a a bar price bar to be reckoned with. They often take some considerable price movement or considerable time after that to reconcile that bar or to trade higher or lower around that bar. So here an outside range again, a lower low and a higher high than the previous bar. Uh, just on the right hand side they come in all shapes and sizes as you can see but it is simply a bar that has a larger range than the previous bar. What I'll do is just bring in um, a chart now. Now I'm using a couple of charting packages tonight. Um, I'll bring this one up. Okay. So when we look at our price action, uh, one of the ones I talk about quite incessantly is is the XJO index itself. And often uh, within the index, we see these outside bars turn up at um, fairly uh, strong places, after, particularly after a rise in the market. We see these outside bars that seem to be uh, turning up on a regular basis that reverse overall price action. And uh, there's an up-close one, uh, but it's still an outside bar and not there, sorry, uh, this one here is an outside bar. So they turn up with, with quite regular monotony as a reversal point as the markets rallied. And often we see them turn up as an outside up close bar as the markets come back and there's a reversal back out of there. So the sellers have been caught on the wrong side and the buyers have entered the market uh, as the market rallies. So it's a, a interesting uh, observation of price that, that you do need to acknowledge that has occurred and you'll see these outside bars at a number of, particularly in the index, at a number of turning points. Uh, also within the, currently within the banks, I just pointed out, I mentioned A and ANZ earlier, sorry about that, what's going on here, uh, okay, now what's happened to my charting, there we go, ANZ uh, recently had a rally up through March, this is a weekly chart and we can see clear uptrend in place and at the very high of the market produced an outside uh, bar here, which hasn't been resolved as yet, we haven't seen the price, the buyers come back in and take that out as yet. And then again, we saw an outside bar at this point here prior to the continued uh, move down. We can clearly see that the uh, ANZ Bank is in a clear weekly downtrend and uh, which has not resolved itself as yet into an uptrend. So um, I'll c come away from that. Okay, there we go. So an outside range is, uh, they're worth acknowledging on your charts and worth um, just putting a uh, marker next to them so you can see them. The other one, of course, is the inside bar where the range is shorter than the previous 
the previous bar. The range has a lower high and a higher low than the previous bar in here. Uh, there are often periods of indecision, quiet days in the market or periods of indecision about um, uh, the stock or the uh, the um, or F, the FX uh, contract or the futures um, commodities future, and there's simply a waiting period. They're a great tool often to build trading systems around, and uh, but they are um, worthwhile uh, just acknowledging on your price chart that they occur, and what happens after that is quite important if they're broken on the high or broken on the low. Also, want to look at a relative strength indicator. Um, just um, a lot of um, uh, talk about overbought and oversold of the relative uh, using a relative strength indicator. So relative strength developed by Wells Wilder is simply a momentum oscillator that, that measures the speed and change of price movements. It oscillates between zero and 100. It compares a recent, uh, it compares the magnitude of recent gains and losses over a specified time period and to measure the speed and change of price movement. So it gives us an insight into price momentum. And it is very, very good for looking at when, when what we can't see on the chart uh, is calculated out here in a relative strength um, indicator. Traditionally, the RSI is considered overbought when above 70 and oversold when below 30. Now, the issue with that statement is that that's not always the case. And often, uh, and I'll bring back my chart here, uh, if we take a look at, um, on the bottom of the screen, I have a relative strength. If we look at one particular stock, sorry, Bellamy's, don't know why it's doing that. But we can see uh, this has resolved itself over 70 recently, uh, a number of times as the stock has just moved higher and higher. Um, out of this, <clears throat> sorry, out of this $4 range into this basically 20, over $20 range, this uh, relative strength has moved into overbought many times uh, throughout its price movement. And you'll see this on a number of very strong trending stocks. You'll see the relative strength that will remain over there. So I'm not a great subscriber to that. What I am a, a subscriber to with relative strength <clears throat> And oh, here we are. I just point out that relative strength is essentially a momentum indicator. And to prove out that little point, I have a momentum uh, indicator here, just simply called momentum. You'll find it in most uh, packages, charting packages, same time, same time period, 14 periods. And I've just overlaid one on the other, and we can see they essentially uh, show the same information <clears throat> as they move up and down uh, with price. What's interesting with relative strength is divergence. This is one of the better trading tools I've found uh, when looking at um, potential changing trends and potential entry points <clears throat> into, into new trends. Divergence is where the market makes a low, and it's made a high, and it's made a new low, a lower low than the previous low. So our trend is in place on the way down. However, as the market makes a low, as uh, in normal circumstances, the indicator will also make a low in here. But in this case, we can see that the relative strength has made a higher low. So the calculations have come out that the relative strength is showing a change of momentum in the way price is moving. This type of uh, di bullish divergence is a very, very good indicator of potential changing trends. And it's not the dis trading decision, but it is a piece of information that will give you a, and this can also be back tested, will give you a higher probability outcome into a potential new trend. And we can see here that even though the RSI has gone into overbought uh, and moved down through here, this trend has simply unfolded into a new trend a new price trend. Divergence is a very, very good application of the relative strength indicator. And here we have bearish divergence, where in this case, the market has made a high. And in line with that, the indicator has made a high, the market has moved back into a low, and the indicator has moved back into a low. And as the market makes a higher high, and as the closing price is the key here, it's made a new closing price high, 
the indicator itself is struggling to make a new high in line with that. We have developing bearish divergence with the relative strength indicator. This is the this area here. If you're holding this position, this is the time to get a little closer to your screen and look for an exit if you're a longer term holder. On a daily weekly chart, that type of thing, this is the this is the area where you're starting to look at for a pivot point reversal or some other methodology to take you out of this potential trend reversal. So RSI divergence is a very, very good tool uh, for um, looking at the potential future movements of, of stocks or not movements of stocks. This chart here is one of my Reuters charts. Uh, we, it's the uh, West Texas oil contract. We can see there's a very strong uh, trend line, confirmed trend line underneath here. Uh, however, as the price uh, moved recently out over this $75 area, we saw this divergence uh, come in with the relative strength indicator and it um, <clears throat> really uh, brought in this uh, this uh, lower price movement here as, as momentum simply ran out and we're seeing oil now just trade along this, uh, it's broken this trend line now and just trade along this uh, bottom area. So there's nothing to see uh, here once the indicator comes into this area here, there's really nothing to see. It's really not of that much use, only to acknowledge that it is above the 50 level. But its job is done now and uh, we'd be looking for other opportunities. Uh, Bitcoin also, uh, this is a weekly chart, sorry, this is a Bitcoin daily chart, I should say. Uh, when Bitcoin uh, topped out, through there, there was significant bearish divergence with a relative strength indicator and set at, set at 14. And we saw uh, Bitcoin uh, move lower. I haven't got it here, but if you look at a chart of Bitcoin on a weekly basis, you'll also find an outside bar at the top as well. Uh, just a note on Bitcoin, uh, a lot of um, people trading Bitcoin at the moment, just as a measure of volatility, Average true range is a measure of volatility. Average true range looks at the current closing price against either the past closing price or the high and low if it's outside the bar. Uh, looks at, the, at this relationship of closing prices <clears throat> and gives you what's called an average true range of price. Currently, and I looked at this today, um, the average true range uh, of one on Bitcoin currently today is about $186 a day. So the current price of Bitcoin is around 6,573. Uh, and I just do a simple, uh, simple manipulation of numbers here. But if you divided the average true range or the average price movement per day into the underlier, uh, it would take about 35 days to essentially double in price or go to zero if it moved $186 per day. Now, it's not going to do that, I understand that, but it, uh, my point is that um, it takes a very short amount of time to actually reach its, uh, to uh, double its price or to um, 186 times 35 equals 6,573. The current ATR on the euro at the moment is uh, 29 pips a day. If you divided that into the euro 1.15 something at the moment, uh, it would take 398 days to recover that price. And gold is the same. <clears throat> the average uh, true range on gold at the moment is $3.23 and would take uh, 397 days to um, uh, double in price or to go to zero. So it's not going to do that, uh, neither is the euro, but it highlights the volatility of Bitcoin against other instruments. Um, and you can do the same with equities, uh, but it highlights this, this volatility of um, price inside uh, Bitcoin. And often Bitcoin traders don't understand that it, volatility is a great thing, but it cuts both ways if you're on the wrong side of it. Getting back to RSI, this is uh, from a very good friend of mine, Ivan. Um, this is uh, his um, schematics of the RSI divergence. Uh, it's very, very uh, specific. Um, and he says it here that it's very strict. Uh, the market must have completed a movement up, a close or a higher close, and then a lower close. So the market must have moved up, made then made a lower close into here, and uh, the 
RSI must register a reading above 70. So the RSI must be above uh, 70 when it does that, down here. And then the market must move down when a more lower closes. The RSI must not register a reading below its equilibrium level of 50. So RSI has a 50 level in here, and it's saying that the lower point in here must not cross that 50 line. The market then must have one or more movement up and exceed its previous higher close. So the market must move up into this area here, uh, sorry, this area here, and it makes a higher close than the previous high. And then the RSI must move above the 70 level, but should not go above the previous high. So this must move above the 70 level, but not above the previous high in there. And that completes this swing failure of rel showing rel relative strength and potential um, price reversal or trend reversal if you're looking at longer time frames. Uh, here it is again, um, and it's the same application as the <clears throat> market makes a low, market's made a low, market makes a new low, but the RSI makes a low and then makes a higher low. And as it crosses that peak, as it crosses that peak in the middle, it's called a swing buy signal and can alert the trader to um, that there's a change, potential change in price movement coming. This can also be back tested. It can be done <clears throat> by uh, a pencil on an envelope, which I always encourage you to do, at least pencil it out so that you know what you're looking for, rather than looking at um, a, <clears throat> rather than looking at some back tested results, which you'll have no feel for. CCI um, commodity channel um, reversion is, a, is quite a simple trading method. And it revolves around, uh, most charting pages have a CCI indicator inside them. It revolves around a 20 period simple moving average. And what's happened if you apply a 20 period uh, simple moving average over some price action, as the price crosses that 20 period average, the CCI line crosses zero. So the zero line here, this is a zero line, the zero line is actually this moving average flattened out in a straight line and looks at the distance that price has moved away from that, the closing price has moved away from that 20 period average. And this is what we're seeing up through here. So as price reverses back to the 20 period average, we see the CCI line turn over and roll back towards the zero line. <clears throat> Now often uh, the, the view is that prices become overextended or under uh, extended both ways, either higher or lower, and a 20 period average is one way of seeing that, and we can see that if pro often when prices cross over um, moving average lines, that might be the beginning of a new move down or weakness in the price. The CCI simply highlights that by crossing uh, zero at the same time. Now, it is simply a mean reversion tool. It is open, um, a 20 period is, is always recommended, and uh, it is a, a quite a useful um, tool for, for looking at the relative price of something, a uh, relative price of your underlying instrument against a moving average. <clears throat> the other one is uh, Bollinger Bands. Bollinger um, made some very astute observations around price and apart from the normal ones that you can read about, the Bollinger squeeze, and, and um, uh, all John Bollinger said was that it just measures, it just gives a value of price against, and again, this is a 20 period average inside a Bollinger band, simple moving average, and it, it looks at, again, looks at the closing price, the distance away from that, and extrapolates that out into a, devi a deviation value and gives a value to the Bollinger band itself. A great way to find uh, an end of a movement uh, is when looking at, in here we can see the very, very strong uh, movement down. A great way to find the potential end of this movement is to look at the opposite band. And we will often find that this band will start to roll as this momentum slows and it may be coming to the end of the move. And here is the follow on from that uh, particular example. So as the prices suddenly come out of here through either short covering or news or something like that, uh, the Bollinger Band did give a, an indication prior to that, um, 
that prior to that reversal and simply showed a slowing of volatility. Uh, Bollinger Bands are a volatility tool. It simply showed a slowing of the volatility uh, in there. Now, <clears throat> um, I just uh, point out uh, one of the other examples of, I'll come back to that, one of the other examples, I'll get my chart out again here. I'll put up the Australia index. And I'll put up the Bollinger Bands on here. Uh, so always a, a 20 period average and standard, two standard deviations. I think that's right for me. No, that's not right, sorry. <clears throat> Should be 200. Why is it changed like that? Don't know. Okay, that's better. One of the other uh, tenants that um, uh, uh, Bollinger talked about was this. Uh, here we are back on the outside bands. Um, one of the other tenants that, uh, one of the ob other observations that Bollinger made was when the clo price closed outside of the band. We had a closing price outside of the band. A few of these others off here. So price down here, I'll get that off there. So we can see price down here is closed outside the band. Then we've had a price close inside the band. That's not really what he was so interested in uh, as much as that saying that the certainly the price movement is moving down. And we can see lots of there's been a close outside the band here. There's been another one here, another one here. The interesting part uh, that the observation that he made is often uh, we saw a market make a lower high. In this case, so there's no evidence of trend change, and then the market made a higher low, and came, but the higher low was inside the band, and the uh, as it crossed that previous high, and this is a weekly chart again, as it crosses that previous high, we have definition of uptrend or definition of trend in place, and we're looking for this to continue. So it's his observation was that when prices close outside of the band, we see a rally in price. Whatever happens after that, the price moves up and price uh, moves back into this secondary move and but forms a higher low and then breaks to a high. This is often the beginning or the end of a, a downtrend or the beginning of a uh, new trend underway. We can also see, I've got on the bottom of the screen here, is the relative strength. And we can see as the market has danced around, through here we can start to see that the relative strength is starting to find slightly higher lows in there and as the market's made a new low uh, down through here markets made a new low we have a higher low on the relative strength not a great um, swing by signal but it is simply highlighting that momentum is also running out uh, Bollinger indicates that price is a uh, price volatility is slowing and relative strength indicates that momentum is also slowing <clears throat> when we apply this into let me take that off there when we apply this into trading from a traders point of view this is the information that we have when we set out to enter into the market. It's the only, it's the, the two, the only two things that we know as traders when we were looking for an entry. In this case, if we decide we're happy with this as a pivot point entry, the low being back here, one, two, three bars out there, or sorry, this bar here is also closed over there. But if this is a large range bar or something, or the indicator has given us a swing over, over a line, or the indicator has given us a swing in here, and we decide that this is part of our methodology for trading, and we have an entry point. The only two things we know are the entry price and the stop price. This is the part that sorts out the amateur traders from the professionals. It is nothing else. The professionals do not have any great magical system that most people think they do, uh, but they do know how to handle themselves when markets uh, don't go in their in their direction. And, and professional traders take as many stop losses as everyone else. I can assure you. So this is all we know. We only know what our entry price is and we only know where our stop loss will be. Whatever happens after that, no matter how much screen staring you do, whatever happens after that has to be a function 
of a trading plan and not a function of you. It has to be a specific, uh, if it does this, I will do this, and if it does that, I will do that outcome. Uh, this doesn't help. In this case, the trade has gone, uh, hopefully, in the direction that we've anticipated, and we have to, really, as traders, we have to understand that after that entry point, it's only a function of your trading plan because no one can know what the price action, what sort of price action is coming uh, in there. And this uh, type of, um, this, if you like, this understanding that it is out of your control, but you're willing to act around it, uh, is uh, will get you off onto a very good start in your trading career. So when we look at what's the game with this, when we start to do backtesting, I showed you some backtesting results earlier that uh, really had a 50-50 outcome um, from win-loss ratio. Uh, so we then ask, well, what's the game? And this is a little, my best interpretation, if you like, of what we're doing in, in, uh, with our, uh, in front of our screens. Um, and really, it's just about simply working out the odds of something. What are the odds of something occurring? This uh, type of approach can be backtested uh, quite easily. What if we have a, a pivot point uh, set up on our charts? What are the odds of it continuing on? And the only way that you'll know that is by going back through your price action and saying, "Well, okay, well here's a here's a here's a pivot point, and my closing price is out here, and it's above the high." of the bar that's made the low, and it's only by you going back through your charts and working out, well, how often does this follow, does it follow through for one, two, or ten bars, or does often does it follow through, or not even follow through at all? And uh, those results will, will uh, give you some very um, sobering um, a view of the market in, in all. So when working out those odds, we build a rule-based approach uh, from that. And uh, so it is taking a simple approach to the market, um, price-based approach to the market, understanding where your trend is. So the game is understanding risk and reward of stock movements. So it's understanding the, the odds of an outcome. And if we looked at a process, <clears throat> if we looked at a process like this, this is the best way I can find to explain it, is if we look at this process, process number one, there is only one outcome. So if we were asked what's going to occur next, the, the most obvious answer is zero. I know people will say, well, it's got to be something else, but you have no evidence that it could be anything else but a zero. And the same here with process two, the only possible outcome is a cross. So that's fine. You've got evidence to prove uh, the outcome, and uh, that's what you would be looking for. When it starts to get a little uh, mixed up about uh, in here, we have a zero and an X and a zero and X, but we see quite clearly that one follows the other. So the next outcome is an X. Yeah, the next outcome is a zero. We have the evidence in the background to give us a outcome here on the right hand side. But then it gets a little busier as markets do, when we have markets moving up, markets moving down, and we now have this almost random outcome in here. We're getting two X's up here, but we're getting three zeros down here. And so we're looking at our next outcome here. In this case, could it be an X? Uh, and here could be a zero as well. And then we get totally random. We have this zero XX zero and these random X's and zeros in here. So quite clearly, based on this amount of information, our outcome here could be anything. It could be an X or it could be a zero. Because we've seen X's follow zeros. There's one in here and there's one here. So it could easily be that or it could be another zero because we've seen zeros follow X's. What we need to see is this, that often in this example here, often there are a series of X's in a row and a series of zeros in a row. And this is what we're looking for in a trading outcome. Sometimes a trade doesn't work for us. If we're looking for, a, if we're opening up a position that says that a zero will come out, often at times an X may show up. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a set of zeros that will give us a positive trading outcome 
in here or a set of X's that will give us a positive trading outcome uh, and they do show up and what that looks like is this where we often get these periods of consolidation in price movements and the idea of a stop loss or the idea of trade management is to keep your account intact until you come across one that gives you four zeros in a row or four X's in a row um, and replenishes your account and that's really the accepting the market as the market is but it's the managing your money around that so the game is understanding the simple risk and reward of stock movement and often traders try and outthink the market and you'll often see particularly on uh, internet sites um, chat sites you'll see charts marked up with with all sorts of things all over them as they try and outthink the market and uh, then broad statements like it's going to go up <clears throat> and like it's going to go up is like saying I know what's going to happen in the next 60 minutes or the next 60 days uh, and we simply don't know that uh, so when we get down to what's called risk and reward a way of applying this to the market is if we decide that this is our entry level here at this next opening or at the close of this bar and we decide that our stop is at the bottom of that bar uh, they're the only two things we can know is our entry point and where our stop point is anything that occurs after that if the trade goes in our favor if we're on the long side of the market if the trade goes in our favor anything that occurs after that can be a, a uh, uh, multiple of this value here uh, and if we decide to set our stop down here we have the same thing R1 and whatever occurs on this upside here can be a multiple of this distance here putting your stop is not that important your stop where your stop goes is not that important how you manage your position size is important when we decide to risk a thousand if we had a hundred thousand dollar bank account we decide to risk one percent per position we're going to risk a thousand dollars so it's a managing our money not the market so much nominate the distance of stop in dollars and cents in this case I've said well if these if the distance to your stop is 32 cents we call that one R that's one times your risk so it you then divide a thousand by 32 cents which gives you a position size so if you're looking at equities a thousand dollars divided by 32 cents will give you a position size of 3125 units if this position size here moved against you by 32 cents you would hand over one thousand dollars of your account or one percent of your account <clears throat> And I've got a note here on um, just a futures contract. Again, if you decide to risk, in this case, $500, you nominate your distance of stop in points, in this case, 10 points at $25 a point, and therefore 10 points at $250 gives you a position size of two contracts. I'll bring up some charts and go through the methodology of that against our against our um, um, against our um, understanding of the X's and zeros game let me take a few things off here this is the XJO interesting today it made a uh, 10 year high today back testing um, these types of strategies simply requires that uh, we go through our chart and say well this is my this is my pivot point entry and I can you can work through the charts and find all of these where it's actually closed over the high of the bar that makes the low and here uh, this one here the bars made the low and this is where the closing price was of course so it's closed over the high I've made the low you can statistically prove these these concepts out here we can see one uh, as the this bar here made the low uh, nothing is closed over the high of that so there was no long entry into this part of the chart and the same here we had a low in here with a higher low next to it and nothing's closed over the high 
of that um, of that bar. So it wasn't the pivot point that we we're looking for. Then occasionally they come up and they start to they then we can say, well, if we our entry point if our entry point is this closing price, let me get a line out here. If our entry point is this closing point price here, if that, and we decide to nominate either here or here as our stop, or even down here is our stop loss area, we can work out what the distance to that stop loss is and simply do the sums and say, well, if it went there, I only, if it, sorry, one goes straight. If it went there, I only want to lose one percent of my account, and we create a position size right here that allows us to take advantage of of potential price movement by only risking one percent of our account. It is a it is a very very good methodology. I would encourage you to look further into it. I've run out of time here, um, <clears throat> and we can see uh, again. This uh, recent movements, this is a weekly chart in the index. These recent movements here have paid off as, as another pivot point has formed. So when you come down to uh, a daily time frame, we can apply the same methodology in a day, daily time frame. This is the index again, quite obvious one down here. Uh, and another one, uh, one, two, three. Yes, we had a close over that high of this bar here. So pivot point in place and reversal pivot points in the top where we get the close below the bar that makes the high. Also an outside bar here on the daily chart, mark the high. And so when we start to break down our charts into, into individual bars and, and looking at particular setups, and I've showed you a very, very simple uh, pivot point uh, setup, then the charts will start to make a little more sense. You can back test them, you can apply money management rules to them, and uh, build a trading strategy out of that that will give you confidence to uh, step into the market. That's all I have to say. Um, thanks, uh, FP Markets, for having me here. And uh, good trading, everyone. I'll take some questions if you like. And uh, we'll call it a webinar. Oh, just bear with me, I'll get some of these questions up here. Yeah, very informative, thank you. Good session, thank you. Good presentation, thank you. Uh, no questions. <laughs> All right. Um, I mentioned that uh, James has mentioned that FP Markets have uh, sponsored the um, sponsored the webinar. Um, I would um, I like working with FP Markets. I find them pretty straight up and down. And if you have any questions around trading accounts or um, FX accounts, it'd be good to um, uh, good to give FP a call. What is the lowest time frame you look at to trade? Good question. Um, I find anything less than 15 minutes or 30, 30 minutes to 15 minutes, I find it too hard. Uh, I, yeah, it's uh, simply too hard. Um, in equities, I simply trade off weekly and daily charts. And um, if you're looking at something like FX, uh, something like that, uh, really down into 30 minutes is getting a bit low, uh, but I choose um, often three-hour charts um, to trade gold, for example. Um, good question here. Uh, should we always... Oh, um, sorry, it's jumping around a bit here. Uh, do you use any MA on your chart lines? No, I don't. I don't use any indicators. I occasionally use the uh, relative strength. I don't do anything other than what I've talked about here tonight. Um, there are some more intimate price uh, patterns that I tend to look at, uh, which we maybe we'll get another webinar together and have a look at that. Uh, where did you learn about pivot points? Um, <laughs> from Ivan. They're very interesting. Um, Ivan, you'll find them in most textbooks, 
most good textbooks. And uh, a little bit of work I've done with a mentor. Uh, also did some, uh, looked at that, and you'll find it also in the Fincia notes uh, in there. So all I've done is applied a rule or, or an observation around uh, pivot points uh, that can be tested. Um, so another question, do you prefer daily or weekly candle charts? And do you make decision using more than one chart period before an entry next? Absolutely, I do. Uh, and I tend to look at weekly charts to gather a view about something and look for a daily entry into that. And uh, good question, when do you sell? Great question. Here's the thing. Uh, Beach Petroleum, recently had a position in Beach Petroleum in here, managed to catch this move from around about $1.18 uh, down in here um, with um, this uh, two bars here made an equal low and uh, so a couple of other things I was looking at and then we had an outside up closed bar uh, which really confirmed that something was, was cooking here but this movement up through here and we can see all the way up here it's had uh, days where it's closed lower than it's open, but it really hasn't shown any strong movement. And then suddenly there was a day here where it simply gapped open. Something had changed um, dramatically. And uh, so there was, I think an exit was taken around about this level here, uh, managed to avoid this next uh, gap down. But there's nothing, uh, for, from my perspective, there's not a lot to see here from an equities point of view. It's simply maybe it's coming in to have a go at closing this gap uh, up in here and I'd be very reticent to look at anything that was uh, just possibly closing out the gap. Um, this is over as far as I'm concerned. Um, one other thing that, and this is just um, something we do, Sydney airports, uh, and here we can see that the this is a daily chart, but we can see that the primary trend is up. I'll just go to a weekly chart on this. <clears throat> the weekly chart has set a higher low in here and set a higher broke out through here. This is interesting, and we have no no information here. Uh, we had a reversal pivot point in here, which didn't follow through. Uh, but other than that, it's simply uh, working its way up through here. So if it gets back into these highs, you'll start to look again for a reversal uh, out of there. We've had a gap up um, this week uh, on the stock. Uh, do I hedge? No. Um, how do you scan? I don't. Uh, very important, I don't scan. I look for... I, believe it or not, I scroll through my entire watch list maybe two times a day, look at every chart um, up and down my watch list, which is essentially the ASX 300 uh, for trading equities. Um, sorry, I've got so many questions here. Sorry, guys. Uh, any resources you recommend for us to read? Books and websites. Great question. Um, Ivan, uh, I mentioned Ivan earlier. Um, Ivan is um, a friend and mentor of mine. Uh, he advocates keeping a trading journal. It's the best book you'll ever read when you go back and look over your trading. Uh, that's one good book. Um, at the Another book that I did read, um, there's two, a couple of books. Uh, one's very hard to get, um, which is a Japanese chart of charts. The other one is a book called Listen to the Market by Ivan Krastens. And uh, another book is um, also quite easy to get is Methods of a Wall Street Master by Victor Sparandio. Uh, there's a couple of books called Methods of a Wall Street Master, but it's the one by Victor Sparandio. Uh, he describes Dow theory to a T in the first sections of his book. And uh, it's a great book to read. Another book I just finished uh, recently was the uh, written by the two Navy SEALs called Extreme Ownership. Uh, it talks about resilience um, uh, around things. Uh, great books. Fibonacci on these charts get the same answer, yes and no. Uh, if you choose to use Fibonacci, uh, one of the better descriptions I've heard is that, and obviously Fibonacci is there because it's sometimes 
uh, self-fulfilling as, as support and resistance levels are met based on Fibonacci ratios, but you still need the price action to confirm that that is going to act as a support and resistance level. A pivot point is one way of doing that, and you can also backtest that as well. And I would encourage you to do the work around that. Is this webinar I recorded? Yes, it is. Uh, and so no alerts, no. No alerts. Uh, what about volume of shares traded? Yes, um, I tend not to look at anything that's traded less than 100,000 units in, on, on average in a day. Uh, it's too hard at times to get out of. How often do you change or adjust your strategy? Um, been trading equities a long time, uh, simply using exactly what I've described tonight. Um, in the, it's acknowledging whether you're in a bull market or a bear market. Uh, is one thing, and then acknowledging whether the trend is up or down. If, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, if we pulled up, I wish I had, I could get the slide up now. If you looked at a chart of, say, the S&P 500 and a chart of Bitcoin, uh, you'll find that they look very similar, not because they're related to each other, but because price goes up, price goes down, and makes highs and lows, and, and all of the basic uh, technical points that we've talked about tonight. Uh, so that it's in all charts. Um, can't answer that for you on the ideal starting capital, but uh, I would encourage you to be wary of margin if you don't have a large uh, capital base. Uh, and I think that's about it. Um, someone wanted to look at A2 Milk. Let's take a look at A2 Milk. We also had A2 Milk, and we piled out on this day here uh, when this, I forget now whether it was an announcement or something, but a very, very strong day. And we can see in the underlying movement of, and this is a weekly chart of uh, A2 Milk. Let me come back to the daily on this. This day up in here, um, we had an entry back back here somewhere, but we the price uh, just opened uh, this day here, opened with a bang and closed towards its high. And this day here, it opened with a bang again, and uh, exited. Uh, I exited at twelve dollars seventy uh, at about ten thirty in the morning, thinking that this is starting to look a bit um, stretched. And of course, it went to thirteen dollars about an hour later, and I thought, well, gee, that was a bit silly. And by the end of the day, it closed back at twelve uh, around. A, back here about $12.10. Um, interestingly, that this large range here has not been breached since and really offers, um, in the from a daily perspective, we can see that this is making lower highs and lower lows and really is quite mixed. There's no, um, we talked about the primary trend earlier, there's no um, really primary movements in this thing. We've got essentially this, uh, maybe this guy here, but essentially this, um, secondary market movement here and potentially a secondary market movement uh, here as well. We're looking for these these primary uh, moves inside markets to get markets higher or get markets lower if you're short. But uh, and here we can see uh, prime uh, sorry secondary movement again and then the breakout and off it goes. And here we've got a secondary movement and a breakdown. So this doesn't interest me uh, one one little bit uh, on there as a potential trade. Could we look at BHP? Uh, 18 more caught in the China trade war or sells in China? Maybe so, yes, but it shows up in the price. And uh, if you go back to my very one of my very first slides, uh, you remember that um, business sentiment and interest rates and volumes and, and all that show up in price. That's what Dow theory is all about. Uh, could we look at BHP? We'll look at BHP, then we better go. Uh, sorry, I'll get that off there. Don't know why my so piece of software is doing that for. Um, we, this is a weekly chart of BHP. Uh, quite clearly, um, we can see that there's an uptrend in place um, in here. Then it entered a period where there was a downtrend. No doubt about that into here somewhere, and now we've had this very strong corrective move uh, in BHP out to this $34. When you, now this is a weekly chart. Uh, when you open this out, we can see in the past 
there is a fairly significant resistance level up here at around about $35 and we're simply coming up to that resistance level. Uh, quite clearly you can see the trend was down into the lows of uh, February 2016 and has, since that time has started to trend up with the occasional um, occasional reaction down here. But as we said uh, earlier, <clears throat> The primary moves, large candles on the primary move, secondary, secondary markets last for three weeks to many months, and then the primary move, secondary market, primary move, and then we've had a strong down move here, we've had a go at the high again, couldn't make it, and had a strong move down. Secondary markets traded over the top of each other for one, two, three, four, five weeks before it broke higher and has a primary move up through here. So currently, the only thing you can offer on BHP is it's inside a secondary market. And I'm with you, I'd like to see it go higher. With that, uh, guys, I'll um, finish up. Uh, thank you again, FP. Thank you, James. And a good trading, everyone.